I'm glad that tonight you will have the opportunity to hear what we have heard all our lives. And maybe that will help you understand. Understand how our island education has affected everything we've ever done and everything we ever will do. Our island education is a guiding principle far deeper than ECU or ASU could ever be. Our education, our perspective of life, the way we see things, the way we try so hard to hold on, all of it together is why Harker's Island, the Harker's Island that we remember, cannot be lost in tomorrow's Harker's Island. So that said, my brother from another mother, Joe Hancock. <laughs> Psychiatrists. <laughs> <laughs> you, you need where they get together afterwards and share notes. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. And I'm really honored to be here this evening. And I'm really, really flattered that so many of you would come. You're either hungry or crazy to be here tonight. So I, I, I and I'm sensitive to the situation. I won't keep you long. I do want to tell you some stories. I, I've got to defer first to Jimmy. Uh, Tell once a couple of stories about what our build a fair was. Jimmy had, had to tell him there was a guy on the island, Brady Lewis. His, he was, he was memorable for a lot of reasons, but when he was up in Raleigh one time, had trouble with the law, and Hugh Salter brought him home. And when he got him out of the got him out of the jail, he took him by the Velvet Cloaking Inn in Raleigh, the finest restaurant there at, at the time. And Hugh ordered prime rib, and Brady ordered the hot dogs. <laughs> And when the waitress said, I'm sorry, sir, but we don't serve hot dogs. And Brady indignantly said, you mean to tell me a cafe this big can't go no hot dogs? <laughs> I, I thought about that when we looked at that Bill the Fair, and I was reminded of the, uh, you know, when I took the candy yams over to Jimmy, Gilbert Russell from the island went with the Methodist Church to give blood at Beaufort and at Newburn and took them out to eat afterwards and he ordered candy yams. And when they brought it to me, he said, Lady, I hate to tell you that, I didn't make up sweet potatoes. <laughs> I want to thank you again for being here. I uh, especially want to thank Ms. Chapel and Ms. Newton for coming. I'm really honored for you to be here. I feel like, in a way, though, I've put a lot of pressure on me here. But then I'm probably going to have to get a grade in some way or another. But I really, really appreciate them and I respect them a great deal. Uh, two teachers that one has already been mentioned that uh, that I would also want to like thank are Mrs. Salter, Ann Salter from Marshall Berg and Miss Rita Jasper, Freshwater. They had a really profound influence on me and taught me how important the words were, uh, written and spoken, how what that words had a meaning. They had a life; they, they could have a life all of their own. And so I, I say this in honor of them. Here's what I'd like to do: I want to tell you about some work that I've been working on for the last several years, and I want to begin by telling, reading you a story I've written. Then I want to just say a few things and then read you another story. So if you bear with me through a couple of stories and you'll get an idea of what I want to talk about. I, uh, the first one, well, let me just begin. When I was about eight years old and, gr and growing into an intense love for baseball, watching it, reading and talking about it, I came to know the very first black man that I could ever remember. His name was James Archie. But no one called him that. Rather, he was known to everyone simply as Mississippi, the same as the state he came from. He worked at Henry Davis's fish house, and he lived in a small one-room frame office at the foot of the dock that had built, uh, been built as a market by Henry's oldest son, Wayne. It was no more than 10 feet square and had no facilities other than a cot to sleep on. Mississippi loaded fish into boxes and the boxes onto and off of carts that ran on a short makeshift railway that ran to and from two docks, one out on the water for loading from boats and the other at the shore for loading onto trucks. He had originally been with a crew that manned a larger fish house in Atlanta. While there he made friends with Wayne, who invited him to come work for him and his father. During his time at the island, he ate at the Davis family table and was treated as a part of the family. He had a large, round face, closely cropped hair, a deep bass voice, and he could have been cast as a character in the popular Broadway play of that era, Showboat. In fact, it's not hard to imagine him entertaining himself while sweating on the docks by belting out a chorus of Old Man River. 
but it was his sinewy physique from his neck to his shoulders down through his arms and chest, all the way to his hips and calves that made him so well suited for the job of listing boxes of fish, shrimp and clams that weighed well over a hundred pounds. He would jerk them with a hook or even his bare hands and then hoist them above his head and stack them onto the cart or onto the truck. And while he did it, he was singing, whistling, or talking constantly to anyone who could hear him. Those same strong arms that lifted those fish boxes could do wonders with a 36-inch baseball bat. In what some have called baseball's golden age and the heyday of Willie Mays and Hank Aaron, who were from his neighboring state of Alabama, this man called Mississippi became our very own Negro League All-Star. And, and this one we could actually watch him play rather than just reading about him in the sporting news or hearing about him on the radio. So you see, fish house work was mostly in the early morning and late evening when boats came in with their catch. During the day, Mississippi usually had time to come with Wayne or with Wayne's cousin, Corn Cobb. To the baseball field, we had fashioned on some vacant pasture land behind the home of Johnny Willis. It was the property of a retired Methodist preacher, Mr. Johnson. Because cattle once grazed there, after the 1964 Republican National Convention held at San Francisco's Cow Palace, some of us later started calling this our Johnson's Cow Palace. We even posted a handmade sign to that effect as you walk down the path to our field. No matter where we were in our games, when word arrived that Mississippi was on his way, the excitement was palpable, and we quickly reconfigured our teams to make sure he had a place. Our field had been fashioned to dimensions meant for lanky young boys who were still filling out their bodies. Those distances proved woefully inadequate when Mississippi came to the plate. He would hit the ball so hard that infielders always moved back several steps to protect themselves for those occasions when he hit anything other than towering fly balls that had to be retrieved from deep in the pines and yopong bushes that were our fences. Since we had only one ball, and he was usually taped and dirty, searching for and finding that ball in green thickets of the early summer was not always easy. But that distraction was well worth the trouble because of the excitement of watching this enormous colored man hit the ball farther than anyone we had ever seen. Just as when he was working the docks, he was as jovial and happy as anyone could ever imagine. He laughed just as loud and, as he, and hard as he played and worked. Given his age and background, he must have known firsthand the sting of racial prejudices that were the norm for that era. But he never let on even the faintest sensitivity that he was in any way different or apart from the rest of us either at the fish house or on the ball field. Perhaps it was for that very reason that we came to feel the same way, that he was just another, bigger, stronger, darker one of us. After an initial consciousness of his distinctive color, at least in regards to everyone else in our group, that difference inevitably gave way to a, an appreciation of his person and his character and talents. After a while, he went from being Mississippi the colored man to Mississippi the hard worker, to Mississippi the ball player, to Mississippi the friend. I'm glad I had that lesson as early and as profoundly as I did. I think it made me a better person then, and especially in those later years after integration when I would come to sit with, play beside, and be taught by, work together, and be friends with black women, men and women in every aspect of my life. The lessons I first learned at Henry's Dock and at Johnson's Cow Palace served me well and served me often. That's an example of the kind of stories. Thank you. Stories I'd like to tell. I've been collecting these stories for well over 10 years. I would write them down when I heard them or was reminded of them. And the, the quest I've been on lately is to try to weave them together. My ultimate goal is to make them a narrative. But there's much that lends itself to a tapestry instead. That story about Mississippi doesn't lend itself very easily, easily to the day-to-day -day life on the island. But I'm trying, Mr. Duke. I'm trying. There's a couple of quotes that I'd like to, to, to give you. One that was an inspiration to me. It was told of Mark Twain. After he 
he'd become the best-selling author in the United States, he made his way back as a middle-aged man, back to Hannibal, Mississippi. And it was there that he received an inspiration that resulted a few years later in Tom Sawyer, and a decade later into what many people consider the classic of American literature, Huck Finn. When he came back and went to Elmira, New York, where he spent the summers, and began to write those pages that would be, eventually become Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, he made a note in his journal that rings so true to me. He said, all the summer world was bright and fresh, and the sun rose upon my tranquil world and beamed down like a benediction. The fountains of my great deep are broken up, and I have rained many rem reminiscences for four and twenty hours. The old life has swept before me like a panorama. The old days have trooped by me in their old glory again, and old faces have looked out of the midst of the past. Old footsteps have sounded in my listening ears. Old hands have clasped mine. Old voices have greeted me. And the songs I loved ages and ages ago have come wailing down the centuries. I can relate to what Mark Twain wrote then. I feel those old hands. I see those old faces. I hear those old songs. I grew up in a world that was defined by a home and a family, the extended families that became neighborhoods, and that molded together became the Harker's Island that I knew and loved. In the work that I'm trying to do, there is a sacred place of honor reserved for old people. I was the last generation that, whose daily entertainment was not television or even radio. It was sitting around listening to people tell stories. Old people had more stories than anybody else. And because of that, they had a place of honor that they have somehow lost in the world we know today. I love those old people, Cliff, Ernest, Turl, Calvin, Grace, Polly, Carrie, Polly. They occupied a place of honor and reverence. Their stories bound us to the past that was theirs and ours. They were the men, there were men, many of them old, who caused us to know what the world that they knew had been like with both their stories and their examples. My children came to know me because I tried to be part of their world. I went to their ball games, their recitals, their programs at school. It was a whole lot different in my youth. I knew my father in his world, not mine. I got to know him on the dock, at the shore, in the boat, on the oyster rock, in the clam bed. It was his world that I came to know him. In many ways, the men were more important to us than the, than the mothers. The fathers were more. We were with them more than the mothers. The mothers were at home. We spent all day with the men of, of our, our world. They were our examples. They were, in the words of Wendell Berry, the author of Jaber Crow, they were rememberers, carrying in their living thoughts all the history that a place like Harker's Island has ever had. I listened to them with all my ears and have tried to remember what they said. Though from remembering what I remember, I know that much has been lost. Things went to the grave with them that will never be known again. There were the people, and there were the stories. And my book is about the people and their stories. <laughs> Learning to write here at Ele Parkers Island Elementary and at East Carteret and, and, East, Car and East Carolina, I developed a, a, a style that at time, and that's why I need Karen and others to help me, it goes from being a reporter to a historian. But I realize that people appreciate most when I'm a storyteller. And so what I've tried to do is tell some stories about Loomis Willis, who moved so many times that when his chicken saw him coming, they rolled over and crossed their legs. <laughs> about Lope Rose, who loved Stu Bloom so much that after he finished the loon and the dumplings, he put his hand out in the pot and then rubbed it through his hair. <laughs> There was Donald Guthrie, who while in boot camp for World War II, after having run horses and sheep and cattle as a young man, when the drill instructor stopped after 10 miles to give him a rest, Donald went up with his legs still pumping and said, we ain't going to get nowhere if you stop every 10 miles. <laughs> the 
it was Barbershop Louie who stuttered when he talked, but he made his point in an unforgettable way. There was Lion Willie, whose name told you all you needed to know about him. <laughs> there was Dallas Daniel, who scared the Eggman so bad that he left the island and never came back. <laughs> there was Prince the Doll, who had a charge account at two different stores. <laughs> there was Luther Willis, the World War I doughboy, who used to hold the cork line while I held the lead line on Calvin and Neil's boat and who talked 40 years later gasping for air because his lungs had been seared in the fields of, Western, of eastern France and would say, help me, jolly boy, I ain't been the same since France. There were snowball alumnus who coached the first ever Little League baseball team and they, would have, they had no patience for a mercy rule. They felt the best way to get mercy was to play good enough that no one had to give it to you. There was Wilson Davis who heard the fans at Salter Pass swear that that ball was high. There's a story behind that that, he, that you can hear from someday. There was Danny Boy Lewis, Brady's son, who said he knew twice as much as his father because he knew everything he knew and he knew everything that he, that, that he himself knew. There was Mary Willis, who told the people waiting in line at the welfare office that they looked like a bunch of damn seagulls. <laughs> There was the young boy from the island, and I could tell you his name, but I'll reserve it, who went to register for the draft. And when Ruby Holland asked him if he were a communist, he thought for a moment, he said, no, I'm common, I'll grant you. <laughs> but then he mentioned another name, he said, but he's probably the communist man I know. <laughs> that was my Uncle Louie, who pulled up his tomato plants, because they were growing so fast they kept him awake at night. <laughs> That was my Uncle Telford, who taught it alone that he missed by saying, fly, Danny, but you'll freeze to death this winter. <laughs> and then there was Tom C. And I'd like to close by telling you the story of Tom C. And then we'll see why in just a moment. My father was born in 1909. He lived to be almost 93 years old, and he experienced several periods of intense hurricane activity. And he, too, had stories to tell about what those storms meant to watermen, especially those who supported a family with a boat tied to a mooring at the shore. But although he had memories of each of them, there was one storm that stood out far beyond all the rest. It occurred when he was still a young man, but married with three small children and living in a new white frame house that was less than 200 feet from the shores of Backside. He sometimes called it the Storm of 33, but more often he referred to it by the name of the Danish fisherman who lost his life in the storm, Jimmy Hamilton. To him and his generation, it was the Jimmy Hamilton storm. Every blow, every nor'easter, every tropical storm and hurricane was measured against the Jimmy Hamilton storm and always in his mind it paled in comparison. He would tell vivid stories of howling winds that caused the walls of his house to shimmer, the rising tide that surrounded his father's and then his brother's house and then reached his own backyard, and then of a rapid ebbing of the water that he eventually learned was the result of an inlet, later called Barden's Inlet, having broken through near Cape Lookout Lighthouse. But for some reason, at least to me, None of those stories resonated as much as the account of what he saw and heard when the winds finally died down and the people of his neighborhood ventured out to see what had been wrought and what had been left by the storm. The humor, the irony, the serenity that is evidenced in that tale captures for me in one simple story much of what life was like or what made life for the people of our island so special and so memorable. As told by my father, the wind began around sundown and shortly after midnight abated enough that he took Mama and the children, Ralph, Ella, Dean, and June, across the path to the home of Cliff and Cottie Guthrie. Even though Cliff's home was closer to the shoreline, it was bigger and higher off the ground. When he got there, he found several other families had the same idea, and a group of over 20 people gathered on chairs around the table and on the floors of Cliff and Cottie's living room. Just as he got there, the wind returned, and for another three hours, the storm-weary group looked, listened, and worried. Finally, just before morning, the winds died out, 
and they left an eerie calm as the sun rose over eastern banks. The new day shed its light on the damage left by what would prove to be the biggest storm for more than half a century. What they saw when they stepped out of the, on the south facing porch of Cliff's house was as follows. Trees, including mighty oaks, had been uprooted. Boats had been torn from the moorings and were lodged in the brush and thickets near the shore. Livestock from the banks, including horses, cows, and sheep, had been drowned and washed across the channel such that their carcasses dotted the shoreline. Porch posts, planks, shingles, and siding had been blown off or washed off homes and were strewn in piles all over everybody's yard. But amid all of this, what my father and the others recalled the most and the best and talked about most often was what he saw standing on the back door stoop of the home of Hinkley and Polly Guthrie. Their home was at the landing between the shore and Cliff's porch, where the storm-weary group had gathered that morning. Indeed, Cliff and Polly were among those who had assembled there with them. But Polly had left behind in their home Tom C., her aged father who had gone to bed as usual the night before, and no one had heard from him since. As he stepped out on the porch that early morning, the, the morning after one of the greatest storms most of them would ever experience, he paused for a moment to observe the desolation around him, including the silver maple tree that had fallen at the foot of his porch steps, with his thin white hair gathered in the middle from a long night on a pillow, and wearing nothing but the faded burgundy union suit or long johns that had been his night clothes, Tom C. rubbed his eyes to wipe away the sleep and to make sure that he was really seeing what first appeared to him. Then looking to the north at the group of family and friends that were staring in his direction from the, across his backyard, Tom C. asked, has there been a blow or something during the night? <laughs> In his honor, I would say to Irene, let it blow, just like Tom C. We'll be here the next morning. Thank you.